this wonderful looking dish. This is chicken fried steak with cream gravy and mashed potatoes that have been fixed up with some sour cream, bacon bits, and plenty of butter. I tell you what, this is a Texas favorite. If you want to try some of the best food you've ever had in your life, give this recipe a shot and it's going to blow your mind. Welcome back. Well, we're about ready to go ahead and make our chicken fried steak. This is going to be a uh, simple dish, and what I have chosen for the meat here is a simple cut of the eye of the round, and it's about three quarters of an inch thick. I'm actually going to pound this down a little bit and use a tenderizer on it, and I'll show you how that's done. We'll use a mechanical tenderizer. Now, to uh, flavor this, to season it, I'm going to use some salt, black pepper, and a little cayenne. The cayenne isn't necessary, or if you want to keep a type of chili in this to give it that chili flavor without the heat of the cayenne, you could also use paprika, and that'll tone down the heat a lot while giving you the warm flavors of a nice uh, chili pepper in the, in the meat. Now, this isn't always done that way in Texas. Usually when they prepare a cutlet in a restaurant in Texas, they'll only use salt and pepper, if that much, on it. Maybe sometimes just salt. Uh, the next item we're going to do is going to be some mashed potatoes. I want to take these two potatoes, we're going to peel them, and we're going to then cube them up, boil them up, and mash them up. And I'm going to teach you how to mash potatoes. There's a couple of different ways it can be done. To add to that, we're going to add bacon bits, some uh, sour cream there and also butter so when I'm doing the mash itself I'll incorporate those ingredients then over here I have some milk we're gonna make some cream gravy and there's a couple of different ways of making cream gravy where there's one that's not so healthy and one that's a little more healthy and that's the one we're gonna do is what's a little more healthy but I'll explain the other method as well as we go and that is just basically where you're using the drippings from cooking the meat uh, or frying the meat rather to make your gravy with and in this case I'm going to be deep frying this so I'm not going to be able to take drippings for that purpose so we'll move on to our next step here we go alright we're going to start our meal by peeling the potatoes and we're going to boil these things first now you can get these vegetable peelers they're very simple little tools they don't cost very much I highly recommend them and you can see why they make quick work of this and what we want to do is just whittle away that skin. You can do a skin-on mash, but the way I'm going to mash this won't work for a skin-on. Um, there are a couple of different mashing techniques that will work for skin-on, and we'll go over those as well. There we are. Okay. Add one potato. I give it a quick rinse just to wash off any dirt that might have been on my hand from when I was peeling it. Watch your fingers around a vegetable peeler. These things do have a tendency to uh, bite when you don't expect them to. You can also use a paring knife for this to gently peel away that skin. Um, there's a couple of techniques you can use there. With a paring knife, you would just simply go around the potato like so, peeling off a thin layer in a rotary fashion or lengthwise if you wish. You can remove it that way. But uh, I find the knife technique takes just a little bit longer. It's not quite as quick as this. And frankly, using that peeler is a much more comfortable way of working. Now, I need to get these peels out of our way. And let's get a cutting board up here. And when we're cutting our potatoes for boiling, we simply need to cut them down so that they can boil up quick. So what I'm going to do is to quarter the potato lengthwise, like so. That's the first thing. Now, when you're cutting, remember, keep the fingers under and the thumb back behind the fingers. And we're going to cut these into about three quarters of an inch to an inch long strips depending on whether it is at the tapered part or if it's in the center. So I want all the pieces to be roughly the same size so they'll cook about the same speed. Here we have hand. There we are. That's easy enough. 
do it one more time. Remember these cuts don't have to be perfect because it's all going to get mashed up later, right? Okay, I just need to fill this with some water and we're ready to boil. I have just now put that little pot of potatoes on the stove and I turned the burner on high. I uh, filled it with water until the potatoes had about an inch above them with water. Now, I'm putting on some of these wonderful blue gloves again. We're getting ready to work our meat. Now, what I want to do is I want to take this eye of the round, which isn't necessarily a super tender piece of meat, and I want to make it a little more tender. I have here with me a mechanical tenderizer, and these are commonly used in uh, commercial cooking. They are uh, illegal in France because people would use them to portray the meat as something it's not. They would be taking uh, like choice cuts of meat and then processing them with a meat tenderizer and calling it uh, prime beef when it wasn't. And so uh, the government there just made this thing illegal even though that's where it was invented. So, <clears throat> the item I want to use, my hand off here, this is a meat tenderizer. And what we have here, if you've never used one of these, this has a series of small knives or blades that stick out from the handle and a spring-loaded retractable base. Now these little knives, when they shoot down into the meat, they won't leave any noticeable marks, but they will tenderize it very, very well. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to take this little guy. Run it across that meat a few times. Go ahead and turn it. Now on a chicken fried steak, what this does is it helps to make a the meat more tender by breaking down the fibers in in, in between the individual meat filaments there. So it, it just by breaking it down that makes it more tender. Now I'm going to do that a little more, but a different method here. Now the next thing I'm going to do to this, we're going to place it inside of a Ziploc bag. And this just helps to uh, keep things a little cleaner, keeps the meat from breaking apart as much. You can also use a couple of layers of uh, plastic cling wrap or even some foil, fold over uh, with foil. Take a skillet, a small skillet will do fine, or a pan. Use the bottom of it and the back edge right along here. And we're going to use that to make that more tender. But what this does is it also further breaks those meat filaments apart. And if you've ever noticed, when you cook a piece of meat, it'll go from this and it'll shrink right up. Well, we don't want that happening when we're chicken frying because if it shrinks up, then the batter stays one size and the meat inside is a smaller size. It has released from the batter. to be a little rough with it. There. Now if you'll notice we have a piece that's much larger. A little larger in diameter. There we are. Now I have a beautiful meat cutlet here that has been processed and that's going to make a wonderful chicken fried steak. Now, the next thing we need to do is batter this guy up, but I'm not in a rush to do that as our potatoes are still cooking, so we're going to give them time to go ahead and cook on up. I'm just going to set this meat aside, and as this meat comes up to room temperature, and that's fine, it doesn't hurt at all, that actually helps the cooking process. Now, if you'll notice in the lower left here, I have some potatoes boiling, and uh, that's what we cut up just a few moments ago before starting our meat. Now, I'm going to go ahead, now that it's come to a boil, and we're just going to add in some salt. 
All right, and I add in a healthy amount of salt. That was maybe a tablespoon worth. Um, in another pan, your fry pan, you're going to want to go ahead and get some oil in there. Now, I put about a quart of peanut oil in this. And uh, what I like to do on my pan is to bring the oil up to about half to three quarters of an inch from the bottom of the pan. That way when I put uh, my cutlet in there, not only is the bottom being fried well, but so are the sides and I get a little more even cook. Now I have some tongs out and ready so I can handle the meat and I'm going to be preparing the batter for the meat next. This particular part of the uh, battering is a two-part process, and uh, or this type of battering is a two-part process. What I'm going to do is first we're going to crack our egg down into the bottom of this bowl. And I want to rinse uh, my hand before I get moving because you don't want to spread that egg everywhere. Now, I'm just going to quickly scramble that. Now if you notice when I do this, I don't go in a circular motion. When you're using a whisk, you're going to get a faster action and a faster mix if you go simply side to side. There we go. Now here I have some buttermilk. Buttermilk has a very thick consistency to it. That thick consistency actually adds to the quality of the batter. There we go. And that was a cup of buttermilk, one egg. That's going to be more than enough for one cutlet. In fact, this is about enough to do two. I have two dry battering techniques like this that I do. One that uses buttermilk and the other uses regular milk. If you're using regular milk, I recommend that you place your meat first in the flour, then in the milk mixture, then back in the flour then in the milk mixture again back in the flour and then fry it if you want that double thick crust and that's what I like is a real thick hearty crust if you're using buttermilk you only have to do that once dip your meat in the flour then in the egg mixture back in the flour and then in the oil and that will give you this wonderful thick crust now it's always a good thing before using a liquid batter or before using the uh, egg mixture in a batter to put flour on it first. It'll help that egg to stick a little bit better and you will get a thicker coating that way. So our batter is prepared, our potatoes are boiling and pretty soon we're going to be cooking up the meat. Let's go ahead and take a moment to season our meat. First thing, let's go with some salt. We just want to gently sprinkle the salt down over this. Now I like to use a kosher salt and I like to apply it by hand. I get a more even coating that way. The kosher salt also makes it a little easier to see. Get some black pepper. And depending on how strong your palate is for hot things, some cayenne. And when you're dusting something like this with cayenne, you want to go light. However, I'll say this. When it comes to deep frying, deep frying cooks a lot of the heat out of, um, in fact, any kind of frying will cook a lot of the heat out of this pepper. So don't worry about adding just a little bit extra. And as you use it, you'll get used to how much you need. There we go. Turn that over and do the back side exactly the same way. There we are. Now my cutlet is seasoned and I'm ready to go ahead and dunk it in some fat. The first thing I'm going to do though, before I go any further, I want to find out just how far my potatoes have come along. Now to test those, what we will need is a spoon and a fork. Grab down a spoon. You want to push the fork into it. If the fork slides in easily and the potato breaks easily, then it is fully cooked. That was still just a slightly tough one, so I'm going to let it cook just a little bit more. I would say this needs no more than maybe 10 minutes more. 
Now, one of the neat things about preparing your mashed potatoes ahead of time is mash holds heat really well. So once you've prepared it, you can simply cover it and it will be just fine. Let's turn our attention back over to our cutlet again. Now what I want to do here, I'm going to take my cutlet, I'm going to place it right down in this flour. Okay. Let me get this other plate out of our way. Now, you can either turn this in the flour if you wish using some tongs, or if you want to be creative about it, simply shake that bowl. See how the flour will flip up over the sides? And it will catch that meat. There we go. There we have it. That's all you have to do to flour out your meat. Now, for the meantime, I'm just going to let that sit there for just a moment. Some of that flour is going to bond to it just a little bit better, and then we're going to put it down in that egg mixture. I'm going to go ahead, let's turn on that front burner. And I want to get this oil up to a nice comfortable temperature and a good temperature for frying a chicken fried steak is going to be between about 300 and 350 degrees. Because your oil is likely to come down in temperature initially, it's smarter to start at a higher temperature. So I'll probably start this between 325 and 350. I'm going to put a thermometer in this. This thermometer is, uh, can be used for frying or candy and there's multiple different kinds of thermometers. There's a dial thermometer that has a metal rod that comes down from it. This one of course is a glass thermometer. They're a little more delicate. Uh, however, make sure when you're cooking in your kitchen that you have a couple of thermometers for knowing what you're doing. Or just an instant read thermometer is also very good for chefs. Our oil is still coming up in temperature. It is uh, right now about 225 degrees. It's only been a few minutes since it was uh, turned on. Let's check one of those potatoes again. Oh, the fork slides in easily and it breaks in half. Those are ready to be mashed, okay? That's how you tell. You go ahead and drop the heat on this. And if they stay in there a few minutes longer in that warm water, it's not going to hurt anything, okay? Now, let's go around to the other side. We'll drain this pan and prepare them for mash. There's a couple of different ways that we can handle our mashed potatoes as far as removing them from the water. I could just spoon these large chunks out with a, a uh, spoon. That would work fine. That's a slotted spoon. Or I can uh, use a strainer like this and just pour them right down into the strainer. I could use a colander such as this. And that way, the colander would catch it. Or if you're balanced enough and good enough, then go ahead and just take a lid, put it over the pan, cock it just slightly like so, and then pour the water off. There we go. That was quite easy. Now if you're using a lot of potatoes for this, it would be smart to have a separate bowl that makes this just slightly easier. Pour these off into that because I'm going to do the mash itself right into this one. Don't worry about those potatoes. They're going to hold heat really well. There's a couple of different ways I mentioned before of mashing potatoes and one of them is the old-fashioned method which is a it looks like a spoon handle but on the end there's either a zigzag wire or a flat plate with holes in it and you simply mash it by doing this while these are in the, the pan. The, uh, another method of doing this is to use one of these guys right here. This is a hand blender, okay? And these work great for doing mashed potatoes. I recommend them. If you have one, give it a shot. Uh, try not to overwork it. Work it quickly, and once it starts getting uh, into the mashed state, just stop at that. Otherwise, they will become dense. Now, there's something about mashed potatoes you need to know. The less you work them, the more light and fluffy they will be. This little device here is called a ricer and what you do is you place an item that's cooked in here, lower this handle and it forces that item through a plate in the bottom that has a bunch of small holes in it. This one allows you to cut different size. Uh, you can do large holes or there's a medium hole size and today we're going to use the small holes because I want the smallest size I can get. 
Now, I want to take my potatoes. All I have to do is simply spoon them into this. I think one of my potatoes, two of them made an escape move on me. Now, see there? If these aren't cooked well enough, they're not going to push through there very easy. Alright? This is called a potato ricer, or in short, just a ricer. You can do a lot more than just potatoes in it. You can do carrots this way, any kind of a root. Anything that's not too fibrous can be worked through this. And even some fibrous items can be worked through from the larger size and you can work it down to the smaller size by processing them more than once. Potatoes, however, push them through one time and that makes for a good consistent mash. Truly, truly the best way to do mashed potatoes. All I have to do now is add in some butter and my other ingredients and stir them in. Now oil has come up to temperature and I just turned the flame off. And that's okay, it can sit there for a little bit, it won't hurt it a bit. Let's put some salt in there. I'm putting in quite a bit, a little over a teaspoon. Potatoes are salt thirsty. Now, I wanted some these wonderful bacon bits. Let's put the sour cream in place. Oh boy, that's going to be extra tasty. And now for some butter. Now I've softened my butter by leaving it out for a little while. And you put in the amount that you would feel comfortable with. If you don't like butter, if you're wanting to cut down on those fats, go ahead and don't put butter in this. This particular meal, I've already mentioned it, this is not good for you. It's a fat filled meal and uh, we're going to do a few things to reduce some of that fat, but still, as far as being heart healthy, this meal is not. And all I have to do is just stir this lightly. Don't overwork it. Gently stir it. And then I'm going to put a lid on it. And we're going to let that butter melt down just a little bit more. And then we'll stir it one more time, but only lightly. Okay, let's turn our attention back to our meat. Now we've had this sitting down in the flour for a little while. Let's simply take it, place it into our buttermilk, and give it a good coating. Get out of that buttermilk and straight back into the flour and shake it just the way we did before. There we are. Now I turned that once while I was shaking it. And I've gotten it thoroughly covered. I have behind here another pan with a cooling rack on top of it and these make a good drainer for things pulled out of a fryer. This song's a bit into my batter a little bit. Put that right down in your hot oil. turning my burner back on because this is going to bring the temperature of that oil down quickly. I took the oil right up to 350 degrees. In fact it was just a little bit over. Turn the oil off. It was cooling while we were doing the battering. Get these bowls out of our way. You're going to want a fresh set of tongs to pull that out of the oil. And on the side over here we're going to start our cream gravy. So while that's cooking, let's turn right back over here. For our cream gravy, I'm going to do a combination of items. I'm going to do a little bit of peanut oil.
And what I want in the way of peanut oil is just a little bit, about two to three tablespoons. And then about a tablespoon to a tablespoon and a half of butter. And I have just that amount right here. I want to turn that front burner on until that butter melts. And then we're going to dust it slightly with a little bit of flour. That meat sure sounds good. I have here a quarter cup measure that has about an eighth of a cup of flour, so about halfway full. Take a look at that meat. It's doing beautifully. See how it floats around in the oil? Exactly what we want. Butter's beginning to melt. Now making cream gravy is a real simple thing. The two different ways that you can do that, as I mentioned before, two different methods of making cream gravy. And uh, one is using the drippings in the pan. So if you're only cooking in a slight amount of oil, turn that flame a little bit, then you can use those drippings. However, you have all the fat that was cooked out of the meat as well, and it makes it a less healthy uh, gravy. In this case, we're going to have a gravy that's made with peanut oil and just a little bit of butter, so the saturated fats will reduce dramatically. And we've increased monounsaturated uh, and polyunsaturated fats as well. Time to turn that meat over. There we go. It's doing real well. Now, our butter's starting to bubble a little bit. Put the flour in there and take a whisk. Stir that. There we go. Now I'm going to let that sit and cook until the flour or the butter mixture takes on the color of a peanut, just a slight tan color. Now you hear how the meat has quieted down a little bit, it's not frying quite as hard as earlier. That means it's not releasing as much juice, and that means it's starting to get cooked. Right now, I have my flame down to a medium low. I'm going to take a quick look to see what our temperature is. Okay, this mixture, the color on it is still a little light. Let's cook some more. Tell you what, if you like good country cooking, this is the best of it all. going that that setup method works really well. Okay, you see the color of that butter? Taking on sort of a peanut color, lightly brown. That's a perfect stage to do our cream gravy from. Once it's on the fire, I'm going to increase the temperature just slightly to a medium. Now, I'm going to pour in my milk. And just whisk this in. There we go. Now I'm going to bring this up to temperature, and as I do, it's going to thicken up on me. I'm going to go ahead and add in some salt, about half a teaspoon, some black pepper, about a half a teaspoon of that also. If you like more, add a little more. 
All right, let's check that meat again. Look at that beautiful golden color. Beautiful. This is what we're looking for. My temperature shows it to be right at 300 degrees. Now the beautiful thing about a buttermilk batter is it stands up to heat really well. So you you can do good long cooking with it. Starting to come up in temperature. And if it does, it's going to thicken on me. It's already started to thicken. And I started with about two cups of milk there. I used about three quarters of a cup, somewhere between that and a cup. And you don't want to add too much milk at the beginning because you want it to thicken, and then if you have to thin it, then thin it. But wait till you uh, get it thickened up first before adding any more milk. I believe that frying has slowed dramatically, and that is almost ready. Check this again. Look, you can got nice and thick on it. Good thick cream gravy. That's what I'm saying is you don't want to add that milk too soon if you're afraid it's going to be too thick. You can always thin it, but you can't make it thicker. And then about another quarter cup there. Reduce my flame to a low. Now, remember that butter we had melting? Give that mash one last quick stir. Just to incorporate those ingredients. Oh, look at that. No more than that. I don't want to overwork it. We want to keep them light and fluffy. Alright, time for my meat to come out of that oil. There's a truly beautiful chicken fried cutlet. Our gravy's about ready. You see how all this came together at the same time? It's all about what you start, when, and the progress that you make with your meal. So when you're combining multiple things for dinner, you have to figure what's going to take the longest to cook, what's going to take a certain amount of preparation, and figure an order in which to do it. That's what you saw me do right here today. Now, turn that burner off. My cream gravy is ready to go. Next thing we have to do is just plate it up. Okay, it's time for us to plate this wonderful Texas meal up. We'll start with placing this right on the front here. Now I want my mashed potatoes. I'm going to take those, put them right in the back. Now I'm one of those guys that likes to have the gravy in the middle of the mashed potatoes. So I'm just going to give it a little opening there. So it'll hold just a bit more. And of course this wouldn't be right at all without a little of that cream gravy we fixed up. Now that stuff can skin over on you really quick. So, if you have a problem with that happening, go ahead and cover it with a lid and that will reduce the problem. There we are. Just until it overflows. There we go. Okay, there you have it. A real Texas favorite. This is chicken fried steak, cream gravy, and mashed potatoes. And it is delicious. I hope you give this a try. Okay, let's give that a try. Cut this guy open. Mmm, look at that. Oh, that's just gorgeous. Crunch of the batter. You've just got to try it. Mm. 
unbelievable. Thank you for watching Texas Cooking today, the show where you can get great recipes and the best techniques are taught. Please subscribe to Texas Cooking today where you will always find something hot and ready to eat.